and welcome to everybody to the uh, the Saturday morning talk. So uh, before embarking on the talk, I thought we could start with some chanting. And uh, Charles, Charles Shaw, I know you're here somewhere. I can't see you on the screen at the moment, but I know you're here. Could you chant the um, homage to the 28 Buddhas? which is a chant which is on page nine of the Samatha chanting book, if you have that available to you, on the, um, the bottom, the, set, the bottom half of the, the chanting book. So over to you, Charles. One day tan hang karang bot hang one day me dang karang morning saranang karang morning one day di pang karang jinang na me one day kom dam yasa Harang one day, Mangala Nayakang one day, Sumana Sambut one day, Re Watanayakang one day, So Bitter Sambut Hang Ano Madas Sing Muning Nakme one day, Paduma Sambut Hang one day, Narada Nayakang Padumutarang Muning one day. One day Sumeda Nayakang, one day Sujata Sambut Hang Pia Das Sing Muning, Nakme Atta Das Sing Muning, one day Tamma Das Sing Jinang, Nakme one day Siddha. Lang one day Tissamaha Muning, one day Pussamaha Weerang, one day we pass in Ayakang, seeking Maha Muning, one day, one day West Sabut Nayakang, Kakusandang Muning, one day, one day Konagamanang, Jinang Kasapang. Sugatang one day, one day go tamana yakang at the wee me buddha nibbana matada yaka na me te sirasani chang te mangrakam tua sabada. So thank you, Charles. And uh, so Veronica said uh, it was an intriguing combination, alchemy and meditation. And um, I do sort of wonder at times, you know, I sort of started as a going to a meditation class, trying to uh, learn how to uh, practice with the, uh, the breath. And uh, somehow or other, here I am on a Saturday morning uh, trying to talk about alchemy and meditation. So of course I'll say a bit about that a bit later on as to uh, how that came about. Um, but uh, it's a very big subject and um, I thought um, for this morning I'd try and focus on something particular. So the something particular is um, a poem and it was written by someone called uh, Sir George Ripley who was an alchemist who lived in the 16th century. Uh, he lived in England. Um, he did have a. He was known by the, as the the title of the Canon of Bridlington. Um, so I don't know whether he was a Canon of Bridlington or not, but that was one of his uh, traditional titles. But he wrote extensively about um, alchemy, including uh, this poem, which is called "The Vision of uh, Sir George Ripley," and it goes something like this. When I was busy at my book, uh, <clears throat> when I was busy at my book one certain night, this vision here expressed, uh, <clears throat> this vision here expressed appeared unto my dimmed sight. A toad full ruddy I saw did drink the juice of grape so fast that overpowered with the char overcharged with the broth, his venom so he overcharged with the broth, his bowels full to brast. And, <clears throat> and from his, um, let's see, check on this. And after that, from poisoned bulk, he cast his venom fell. From pain and grief thereof, his, t his members all began to, to swell. And from his with drops of poison sweat, approaching thus his secret den, his cave with blasts of fumous air, he all be whited then. 
than from the which in space a golden humour did ensue, whose falling drops from high did stain the soil with ruddy hue. And when his corpse the force of vital breath began to lack, this dying toad became forthwith like coal for coloured black. Thus drowned in his proper veins of poisoned flood, for term of eighty days and four he rotting stood. For trial then I did his, his venom to expel I did desire, for which I did commit his carcass to a gentle fire. After which, a wonder to the sight, yet more to be rehearsed. The, diet, the toad, with colours rare, through every side was pierced. Then white appeared, after the various hues had passed, which after being tinted ruddy, for evermore did last. And from the venom handled thus, a medicine I did make which venom kills and saveth such as venom chance to take. Glory be to him, the granter of such secret ways, with dominion and honour both, with worship and with praise. Amen. So that's the, the poem. And um, as he says, uh, well, he claims in the... Uh, uh, at the beginning of the poem, somehow that it was uh, a kind of, of dream. Um, so where he says about uh, a vision that appeared to his dimmed sight. Um, so that's the poem. So I'm going to take that as the um, the focus for the, the talk this morning. Um, but to go back to that point about how come um, this topic came up in the in the first place. Um, there's a group of people meeting in Manchester, I said meeting in Manchester, uh, of course in Zoom days we're meeting from all over the place, but there's a group meeting um, originally based in Manchester um, uh, who are studying alchemy at the moment and previously had been also readings in, in Search of the Miraculous by Spensky about Gurdjieff's teaching. And it came about because um, on the instigation of Bernard, Bernard Bolton. I'm sure many of you uh, know but, uh, knew Bernard, uh, but Bernard uh, was a very inspiring teacher who taught for, for many years in Manchester and very tragically died in 2016. But during the time he was uh, ill, he died from um, a brain tumour. He instigated um, a, uh, this particular group and it was based on mainly on people who had been on a course with him a year or two before at Green Street, um, which had been titled something like uh, Images, where people were encouraged to come to the course with a particular image from any sort of tradition that they wished. And there was the opportunity during the course to, to talk about that, so to show that image and talk about it. Um, and I think one thing, if people who um, were fortunate enough to be taught by Bernard, was the way in which he used to, to draw upon a very wide range of traditions. Uh, and that was very evident in that images course where he drew on all sorts of things, you know, just talking over the dinner table, talking in meetings. He'd draw upon all sorts of things. Uh, I don't remember. Perhaps other people will correct me on this, but I don't remember him talking about alchemy in particular on, um, uh, during that course. But certainly during the time that he was teaching in Manchester, he taught various people uh, things to do with, uh, with alchemy. So when the particular group met, and Bernard was only able to come to the, um, to the very first meeting, um, <clears throat> During the, the time that it met, we sort of worked our way through the In Search of the Miraculous book, came to the end, and decided that um, we sort of continue as a group working on something different. And what came up at that point was alchemy. Um, as part of that sense of um, exploring uh, a variety of traditions, and I think I think I'm right in saying more than one person in the group had done some alchemy with Bernard previously. And so there was that sort of background 
to it. Um, it raises the, um, the question of why do that uh, in any case? And that's perhaps something I'll try and talk about um, towards the end of the, the talk this morning. So um, for the moment, I'll press on with um, saying something about alchemy. Um, so focusing on George Ripley's poem, drawing on one or two other things, but not trying to draw on too many things because there's a lot written about alchemy. But the other one I will draw upon a bit is something called the, um, uh, the Emerald Tablet, which um, is supposedly written by someone called Hermes Trismegistus, who was uh, allegedly a, an Egyptian alchemist. Whether that's the case or not, I don't know, but that's the tradition. But um, if you don't know anything about alchemy of, at all, or very little, I'm sure the little that you will know is that alchemy is concerned with uh, with making gold or finding what's known as the philosopher's stone or also called the elixir of life. So there's a very strong tradition in alchemy of making gold, um, either from refining existing gold and making it better or through making gold from baser materials or if uh, best of all, if you can make the Philosopher's Stone itself, which will transmute uh, most materials into uh, to gold. And also um, there's that sense in which it's not just ordinary gold, but um, alchemists gold, or as they usually refer to these things as our gold, our this and our that, but our gold is something that's even more refined and more precious than uh, the metal gold itself. And um, I, I don't have many associations with gold. I'm not handled gold very much. Um, but um, when you think of its properties, one of the reasons why it's so special, the things to do with, obviously, its color, it's a really shining uh, yellow color. color. Um, it's got this particular luster to it. It does shine. Um, it also is very unreactive. It doesn't rust, it doesn't seem to get contaminated by, doesn't react with other materials. It maintains its purity. Um, and then uh, on top of that, which must have seemed more than a coincidence to alchemists, the fact you can actually work with it, it's very malleable. You can make jewelry with it. You can draw it out into very fine, um, pieces without it becoming brittle, without breaking. So it's rather too much of a coincidence that there is this wonderful golden shining material that can be, um, uh, is malleable and can be make things from it. Um, and also as I say, it's not, uh, not just the gold itself, but you can also make this um, elixir of life, which uh, has quite a strong emphasis in Western European uh, alchemy, and it's even stronger, I gather, in uh, Far Eastern alchemy as well. But with the elixir of life, it gives you uh, immortality, so, uh, and full health and vigor. So it's quite, uh, quite something to, to find if you can find it. Um, I mean, coming back to the gold, I don't have many associations with gold. Um, I've not, uh, not got any gold jewellery, unfortunately. Um, but I suppose one or two associations. I remember going back to, must be 20 years ago now, in the Manchester Centre. The, um, those of you who have been to the Manchester Centre know we've got a, a magnificent large um, Buddha Rupa, Buddha statue, in the main shrine room. Uh, I thought it was big. I still feel it's big until I saw the, the Green Street one, which is even bigger. But uh, nevertheless, it's still a very striking uh, Buddha Rupa at the Manchester Centre. And it was lent to us, lent to the Manchester Centre, first of all, by the Thai Vihara in London. And then they donated it to the, uh, the centre in some time in the mid 1990s. And it was um, it's made of um, metal, it's very heavy. Uh, I think Bernard was one of the uh, 
the people who uh, organised the the transport of the the route up from London and then getting it into the uh, the Manchester building itself. But um, it's gilded with uh, with gold leaf, but it was looking a bit worn in various places. So one of the first things that happened uh, when after it had been given to the Manchester Centre is that it was gilded with gold leaf. So again, I'd never never seen gold leaf before, never mind used it, but you can get some small, smallish squares of gold leaf, which is very pure gold, but very thin. And then you can lay it very gently on the, the surface of something and it sort of adheres to it spontaneously. So um, we, um, people who were around in Manchester at the time had the opportunity to uh, to learn a bit of craft with the uh, gold leaf and regilded the uh, the Manchester Buddha Rupa. Um, and it does have this magnificent uh, gold leaf covering to it now, um, which is very beautiful. So that was one um, association I have with it. And the other one that does come to mind is the um, the relatively new sign at Green Street for which says the Samata Centre. So on the one side of the entrance you have the sign that says Green Street Farm, on the other side you have the, the stone, um, big stone which has on it the Samata Centre in Welcome to the Samata Centre in English and Welsh. And the, the lettering is being picked out on the stone and um, didn't look, the lettering didn't stand out when it was first put up. And since then, the lettering has been, um, uh, Paul, Paul Dennison organised the, the, the gold leaf lettering, uh, which does stand out now. And the, the um, Samata symbol in, is being brought out in gold as well. And it makes all the difference to the sign. It makes it look much more beautiful. Um, so those are a couple of associations I have with gold. Um, I haven't read uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's funny, the, um, in this context, this particular memory came to mind, which is watching a television program called The Detectorists, um, which is a very gentle comedy. It's about two people who are metal detectors, or as they say, I'm not a metal detector, that's the instrument, I'm a detectorist. Anyway, they... Um, Detectorists usually find uh, fairly rubbishy sorts of things, to be honest. The, you know, the can, ring cans or tin cans and so on. Um, but they dream of finding something like the, uh, the Saxon Hoard, which is quite a very famous and very extensive collection of uh, Saxon jewellery, which somebody found, and I think it was a detectorist found that. But anyway, in the um, one programme, um, of the uh, the detectorists, there's a scene where the the central character is there with his metal detector, and he gets a beep beep beep, and he digs around where the the sound is coming from, expecting to find something uh, fairly mundane, but hoping it's going to be something more, and um, he finds a gold coin which is absolutely wonderful. So one of the things you do as a detectorist is you, you uncover it very gently, the soil around it, and you take a photograph, it, it, a photograph of it in situ. So he's left his bag of equipment about 30 or 40 yards away. So he has, leaves the, the gold coin partly exposed and then walks away to his bag. And meanwhile, the camera is focusing or shows a magpie that's coming down from a tree. <laughs> and the magpie comes and sort of uh, uh, stands near the gold, kind of gold coin and sort of looks at it. And you can see the detector is coming back towards the gold coin uh, and then realizing what this magpie might do. And of course, what the magpie does do is that it picks up the, the gold coin in its beak and flies away. <laughs> so, and uh, it just, um, I don't, in this context, it just brought to mind that sense of uh, sometimes in uh, meditation practice, you find something 
and you go away to get your camera to photograph what you've experienced or to uh, try and remember what you've experienced in your practice. And in the meantime, a magpie comes up and takes it away. <laughs> so uh, uh, I don't know whether that says something about my practice or not, but um, it certainly came to mind in this context. But um, anyway, going back to um, the, uh, the vision of Sir George Ripley, and uh, the poem, as you, if you remember the detail of it, doesn't end up uh, producing gold, but producing a medicine. So it's in that tradition of the, uh, the medicinal properties of the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life, which is in itself a refined form of gold. And um, it's just a bit of, uh, I mean, I think with the poem, there's sort of, it obviously, assumes a great deal in terms of the background for what alchemy is all about and what the quest for the Philosopher's Stone is about. Um, so just to bring in one assumption which I think is there, that because making gold, um, when you, if you come across it for the first time or making the Philosopher's Stone, either sounds completely balmy and completely um, stupid, or it sounds a bit kind of um, strange, you know, sort of arbitrary. Um, but part of the kind of general intellectual assumptions of the, of the times is going back to um, the alchemy in England between the 13th and 17th century. That um, one of the assumptions was that there was a kind of unity in the way all sorts of different things developed. So you have things like uh, the way that um, humans and animals develop from um, a fertilized egg and grow within the mother's womb, and then they're born as a baby and the baby grows up to be an adult. So there's something, as it were, inside animals and humans which is promoting that kind of growth to maturity. Um, and as a kind of link with that, and this goes back to ancient Greek thought, that there's a same similar sort of principle that is working in the formation of various minerals and ores which are present in the, in the earth. So um, the thinking at the time was that, that gold is the mature form that has developed from simpler and more baser kinds of materials once it's or when it's been buried in the ground for hundreds and thousands of years so because if you think of the conditions under the ground that there's a great deal of pressure there's all sorts of vapors uh, being present that there's movement of rocks and all sorts of things movement of water um, and other liquids in the in the ground, which is all part of that process of the development of and change and maturing of baser kinds of materials into valuable minerals, including gold. So one of the basic assumptions at the time was that there was no difference really between that kind of development and the development of living things, the development of animals and plants, and the development of the, the human body. But again, there was the thought that the human person is something which is undeveloped in its early stages, and it's capable of developing into a more mature form. So that was like the process by which the, the gold develops in the, um, in the earth and becomes mature in the, as, the, as, a, as the substance of gold. So it wasn't such a strange quest to have to try and um, to search for a way of imitating that process that was happening in the earth, or better still, um, to speed it up, or better still to have something like a, a philosopher's stone which could change mater other materials very quickly into to gold. So that's a kind of um, a background to, to the, uh, the quest for the elixir of life for this medicine 
that's expressed in the, the vision of Sir George. So um, let's go back to the beginning. And it's interesting, um, the first two lines of the poem are very short, but they're very kind of um, atmospheric in the way that they sort of set things up. So he says, um, when he was busy at my book, so he doesn't even say whether he's reading a book or writing a book, but you immediately get a sense of um, being working in some way, perhaps reflecting and thinking about things. Uh, and it was a certain night, so it wasn't just any night. I mean, in a sense, any night, any time can be a certain time when something happens something significant happens. Um, but as he says, this was a certain night. And as uh, I mentioned before, it says, this vision here expressed appeared unto my dimmed sight. So whether he was dreaming or whether he was meditating in some way and withdrawing, uh, his mind was withdrawing from the senses, so his senses were dimmed, could have been either. And the ambiguity of it is quite interesting. And the next lines, um, so with this, I mean, if you've got a visual kind of mind, you might very lightly emphasize, quite lightly um, visualize what's going on in the poem. Um, but it says, um, a toad, a toad full ruddy. And um, is he by a toad? I did, um, <clears throat> look at, um, I've not seen various toads in my life. I think they must have been more common in George Ripley's day. People were more familiar with them uh, and perhaps could have tended to overlook them as rather inconsequential creatures. But um, one of the things that's emphasized in the general literature on alchemy, the general texts and general practice, is to do with that you have to find the material for starting with. And um, one of the things that they, they say about this material called the, uh, the prima materia is that it's very common, everybody knows what it is, but nobody really recognizes it for what it is. Um, so something like the, the toad, which is, we can imagine, quite common, it's always around the place, is not particularly beautiful as uh, uh, and uh, most of us are not particularly beautiful, commonplace. Um, uh, I did look at one photograph of a toad, though, um, care of the, the internet, and it was quite striking that the, the eyes, it has quite big eyes, and the surrounding the pupil can look a bit golden. So perhaps in the toad there is a bit of gold in its body, which can form the basis of the... Uh, the formation of pure gold and of the elixir. So the toad is full ruddy. Uh, ruddy is a color that comes up, I think, two or three times, three times in all in the poem itself, and uh, perhaps denotes something about um, the health. We usually think of ruddy people as healthy people, so there's something to do perhaps with that. Um, I looked it up in the dictionary, looked up quite a few words in the dictionary uh, for this poem. And it says that ruddy can be applied to, usually talk about ruddy faces, and you also talk about ruddy skies, where the sky is sort of tinged with red sometimes. Um, and there was something else as well, which I can't remember, but the, that sort of use of ruddy is quite interesting. And it goes down to something quite mysterious. So there's a toad full ruddy I saw, comma. So he's obviously struck by this toad. They drink the juice of grapes so fast till overcharged with the broth, his bowels all to brast. So brast meaning to, to burst. And um, what a, a strong image of this um, toad having his uh, his bowels full and full to overflowing and then bursting. And um, it's not 
it's a very powerful image. And I think with, um, with this poem and lots of other alchemical images, they have quite a strong, or can have strike quite a strong impact, even if you don't have a clue what they actually mean, if you sort of start thinking meaning in terms more of a kind of explanation. So um, what the kind of, <clears throat> there is um, a commentary to, the, to this poem by um, an alchemist, a 16th century alchemist, and he refers to the, um, the emerald tablet, this mysterious emerald tablet, which originated allegedly in Egypt and came down to, to Europeans through uh, uh, Arabic cultures. And uh, you've probably heard of this particular statement, that the emerald tablet is a statement of about 12 uh, principles. Um, and very first principle is says something like that which is below corresponds with that which is above and that which is above corresponds to that which is below to accomplish the miracles of the one thing and it's <clears throat> the explanation of that is given us that there's a separation going on between two parts, um, one to do with the spirit and one to do with the, the body. And uh, I thought at this point I would try a bit of um, screen sharing uh, just to show one thing. Um, I mean, the, the internet can be very useful nowadays for looking up all sorts of things. And on YouTube, there are all sorts of things. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find um, photography of the creation of gold, um, but I did find something which is quite interesting. So let's see if I can show it. So this is uh, Mercury, uh, which uh, you may be familiar with or know about, uh, encountering some gold leaf. So if I find the equivalent. Let's go back a bit. So here's the, the gold leaf, just like the ones that we use on the, um, the Buddha Rupa in Manchester. Here's the, the mercury. So they have um, a photography of um, mercury uh, dissolving gold, which was something that um, the alchemists knew about. 
um, all sorts of practical things. They, they knew about various materials and um, they knew about this quite amazing phenomenon that gold, which is such a, an unreactive material, which doesn't rust, it doesn't uh, decolor like other sorts of metals can do when exposed to the elements. Um, but nevertheless, mercury has this property of being able to seemingly to dissolve gold. Um, and there's been all sorts of changes since the alchemists' day about the, the science of materials. And we, I suppose, to be a bit pedantic, the, the mercury is not dissolving the gold, but they're forming an amalgam. But looks very much like dissolving. So um, the alchemists knew about mercury and they knew about this way to dissolve gold. And they saw it as the first step in the, the formation of making purer gold and ultimately making the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life. It goes on in the poem to say, um, I saw the drinking the grapes. So this is rather like drinking the, the mercury or the solvent that was being used in the first part of the gold making process. Till overcharged with his broth, his bowels all to brast. So it's sort of dissolving and breaking up. But the next line says, um, and after that from poison bulk, he cast his venom fell. So the fell is uh, something which is deadly or fierce, cruel, terrible, as I looked up in the, the dictionary. And um, one sort of in the commentary, it says that I pictured this originally as some sort of fluid but I think the idea is more kind of um, a gas or a, a vapor of some kind. So what's happening with the, the toad is that it's separating into two components. The, the part which is dissolving and forming the broth, which is mentioned in the, in the poem, and a gaseous, what we would call a gaseous part, a va vaporous part to it. The, uh, the venom. And again, this is part of the assumptions that were, uh, the ideas that were current at the time about the nature of materials, uh, which goes back from, goes back to ancient Greece and ancient uh, Egypt, that to do with the, the nature of a material being formed of two main parts, one they call the body and one they call the spirit. And um, it was based upon observations like, um, say, a commonplace burning of something. So you take something which has a very definite shape. Um, you have a log, for example, and you put it on the fire. And in the fire, it seems to break up into the, the smoke and the gas, which goes upwards. And the end of the process is that you're left with ashes and cinders, which are the parts which can't burn. So you have these two parts, the gaseous part and the, the part that doesn't burn. So the body and the spirit. And um, it's the spirit that people thought which gave the, the original object its form, which sort of gave it its life in a way. So uh, while so-called inanimate objects have a particular form by their spirit, so the humans, have a spirit which gives them a form, um, and that is the form that you see and work with is the, is the body. So you have these two parts um, being separated. So this is the first part of the first stage of the alchemical process, the separating of the spirit from the body. So uh, there are all sorts of um, similes which are given for this process, which um, I won't mention for the moment, but um, going back to the um, emerald tablet, what they talk about in the emerald tablet is the, you separate the thick from the thin, or the subtle from the gross. So you're separating these two, two parts. 
The next thing that happens in the poem is um, after he's cast his venom fell, we get these venomous exhalations coming. But um, for the toad, his members all began to swell. And the explanation that's given for this is that these exhalations are coming back into the solid part of the body, into the earthy part of the, of the body, and causing it to, to swell in the same way as that if you get bitten by a mosquito or something, you get a swelling. Or if you're bitten by something more venomous, you get swelling. So it's that kind of, of thing. Um, so the, as it says, the, the body swells or puffs up. Um, next, going on with the poem, you have um, the drops of poison sweat. So there's a great deal of imagery to do with venom and poison, which is um, generally to do with the fact that you're purifying something, I think. This is my reading of it, really. Um, so you know the conclusion is that from the venom, the medicine is made, but it is very venomous to start with. But the, um, the toad approaches a secret den and in his cave, and the um, explanation of that is that um, early on in the process, or perhaps even at the very start, the materials that the alchemist is using to, to make the Philosopher's Stone are put in a particular vessel and sealed. So all the processes subsequent to that take place in this sealed vessel. So this is the, the toad's secret den, his cave. And in the poem it says, his cave with blasts of fumous air, he all be whited then. So again, if you're picturing this in your mind's eye, you've got these fumes coming up from this dissolved body and they're uh, um, condensing on the side of the, the vessel. So if you were um, an alchemist, you'd be looking at your vessel and you'd be seeing the whitening occurring on the inside of the vessel. And <clears throat> You can get this um, golden humour, which comes, yellow exhal exhalations. And in the commentary, it mentions other colours as well, sort of darkness, obscurity, blueness, all to do with the fact that the exhalations are condensing. And the commentary says that they form drops on the inside of the vessel, and they're sort of dripping down and going back into the earthy material, the cinders, the ashes, at the bottom of the vessel. And uh, so you've got uh, this blast of fumous air, he all be whited then in space, a golden humid did ensue. You've got the falling drops, whose falling drops from high did stain the soil with ruddy hue. So the ruddiness, I think, in this case, is to do with the, the liquid part that's doing the uh, dissolving of the, um, of the material that you started with. So uh, the alchemists, I think, are very, very fluid in the way they sort of switch between different words for particular substances. So from liquids, we've had the got blood now, as well as the, the mercury, and the juice of grapes, which came in right at the beginning. So those are all I think different words that have been used to describe the, the process, the material that's used for the dissolving of the prima materia. Then there's quite a big change at this point. But I have to, <clears throat> what you have to imagine, I think, is that this process of um, the exhalations coming off the earthy material and then condensing and coming back and then going back up, coming down, this constant circulation of materials between um, sort of separating process going on and then a reuniting of the materials of these, the spirit and the body. So this goes on many, many times and may take quite a long time. 
and you can well imagine the the alchemists who are looking at his sealed vessels, seeing all these changes going on, and being very concentrated and focused on it, following the process in detail, making adjustments to the heating of the of the vessel, which is also important. But eventually, you get this quite significant change, uh, where it says, um, and when his corpse the toad's corpse, the force of vital breath began to lack. So at this point, this refers to the completion of this sort of cycling process. So that by the cycling process, there's a purification of the venomous exhalations, and there's a purification of the earthy, ashy, cindery type of material at the bottom of the, the vessel. Um, and when that process completes, then, as it says, the, the vital breath lacks because the, there's no more exhalations. They're all contained at the material now at the bottom of the, the vessel. And as it says, this dying toad became forthwith like coal for colour black. So uh, they refer to this stage as one of uh, decay and putrefaction. So um, if you've got your compost heap at the bottom of a garden, if you've got your garden, uh, eventually if the compost heap works nicely and there's a, a good decay of the material, then you get this dark material being formed that you can uh, then use to fertilize your, your garden. And the same similar, I think, is being applied here, that the blackness comes from the um, decay and putrefaction and decomposition of the initial materials. Um, one thing that's said about alchemy is that this stage of blackness, the simile of the blackness, goes back to the black soil uh, created by the flooding of the, the Nile. So Egyptian, the ancient Egyptians were very dependent upon the flooding of the Nile and did the, all their farming in quite a narrow strip either side of the, the Nile. But every year the Nile would flood and you get this very dark soil being created. So perhaps it goes back to, to, that, to its origins in that way. And the poem goes on. Thus drowned in his proper veins a poison flood, for a term of eighty days and four he rotting stood. So, uh, I think I've been in reading it, I felt reasonably clear in my mind that the first stages were due are being described as this sort of cycling process of separation and a reuniting of the, those two materials but a certain, you know, constant cycling between um, dissolving, uh, evaporating or subliming, condensing, coming back and so on. Um, I'm not quite sure what this, uh, what the toad's body is like at this stage. In the commentary, it refers to um, it's like melted pitch and I've seen melted pitch or the process you know, where you put some tarmac on the, uh, on the roads. Um, you have to heat up this pitch and it's all sort of bubbling away and they sort of spread it on the surface. So I'm imagining it's something like that. Um, and there's some process which is going on within this dark, viscous um, liquid in the vessel, which is completing something um, at this point point in my sort of alchemical explorations, I'm not quite sure what, but something's going on which is coming to completion. And at that point, there's another change. And there's very little commentary on this, on these next few lines, um, but the, the alchemist concerned by trial then, this venom to expel I did desire and commits his carcass to a gentle fire. Um, I mean, heating is very definitely part of the process of creating the Philosopher's Stone. 
um, sometimes a bit clear when the heating happens, at what stage it happens, or what stages it happen, happens, or whether it's referring to an external heat, or whether it's also referring to an internal heat, which is generated internally in the chemical reactions and processes going on inside the body. But it does say at this point, a gentle fire, that you've got to be very attentive and careful not to overheat it, but not to underheat it so you don't get anything happening at all. And then a wonder to the sight. The toad with colours rare through every side was pierced. And then you get the white colour, and then you get uh, the ruddy, the tincted ruddy, forevermore did last. And uh, didn't say much more in the commentary to the poem about what's going on here, except it is very obviously the completion of the process. And the reference to being tincted rud ruddy um, does key into the whole um, nature of creating tinctures or medicines in the traditional alchemical way and possibly leading on to homeopathy as well. So uh, it sort of hints that there's quite a lot going on which is not being said because creating tinctures is quite a complex process. But then as he says, then of the venom handled thus, a medicine I did make. Um, rather interesting, he didn't say how. <laughs> so, uh, it leaves you to, uh, to work that out perhaps, or perhaps he thinks, well, if you got to this stage, you know, you, you're well on the way, just keep going on that, uh, in this process going on. And as it says, the medicine, um, kills the venom and neutralizes the venom. It's an antidote for the, the venom. And uh, it saves anybody who venom chances to take, which of course everybody, as we know from the toad, everybody has venom in them anyway. And the final bit about glory to the grantor of such secret ways. So um, there we have the, um, the poem. And uh, I say the, it's one, <clears throat> one description of the alchemical process, in this case, creating this particular medicine, the elixir of life, which is the antidote to all poisons. Um, there are, in other, from what I've seen in other texts, there are lots of other descriptions of the process. Uh, and it's sometimes quite confusing to try and match them up against one another, they seem rather different. Um, but with a, a complex process like this, you'd expect um, different people to do it, do the process differently. So that's not, not too bothered by that. But um, coming back to the question I sort of had at the, be the beginning, is that um, here we are, a group of uh, Samatha meditators, um, why, do you, why might you find it useful to, to know about alchemy? Um, I suppose one answer might be, perhaps you don't. Um, but I think going back to what I was saying about the Bernard's way of teaching, of drawing upon other kinds of traditions, uh, that can be, can be very useful. Um, and it can be very useful, I think, in terms of giving a different, um, can be, it can be resonant in different sorts of ways, in ways that perhaps don't come across so well for, well, I mean, so going back to make it more personal, I suppose, that I do find the, the, the Buddhist texts and theories that we've worked on uh, in various different groups um, very useful and uh, very evocative of how to do meditation, whether it's sitting meditation or meditation in everyday life. Um, but I don't know whether I respond to the sort of fullness of it. And reading something like um, 
something like the division of George Ripley does give a quite a different or a new um, sort of sense, a different kind of sense, a different sort of feeling for what meditation practice uh, in all its many different forms, what's, what meditation practice is like and can sort of awaken a sort of sense of uh, it's sort of something like something like this um, which I think is part of the the way in which um, we I do meditation practice you have a kind of of you know why I keep going at, keep doing it is that sense of sort of there's a feeling that something can grow and develop from from that it's finding that sort of initial feeling that to uh, allow to to grow and develop so um, there are certain things about certain aspects of the uh, meditation which seem to be described in the or evoked in the uh, in the poem which are kind of for me it's sort of unfamiliar in a way um, so describing the um, the process in terms of this um, um, dissolving and evaporation or subliming and a recombining a sort of separation uh, by those processes and a recombining of those materials of those purified materials um, is very is very evocative so um, at a very basic level um, one of the instructions that I think most people will have received at, um, when they go to the meditation class for the first time to do with the, the posture of the body is to do with the way that uh, you can feel the, uh, the weight of the lower part of the body in contact with the ground and being the support for the body. And at the same time, whenever I remember the, um, the instructions was to, to draw your chin in slightly, and which raises the, the crown of the head um, to a certain extent. Um, in a different context, the, there was the instruction about imagining a thread from the, the crown of the head and being suspended by that thread so you have this combination of feeling um, very well supported on the ground and you can feel the weight of the body through into the ground and the lower part of the body being heavy and the upper part of the body being light being suspended by this thread to do with the alignment of the uh, of the spine um, which seemed to me to be very much to do with that sense of these two components to that's the right kind of word two elements to um, one's being a sort of something which is being lifting up which tends to uh, levitate if you like and there's a part which tends to gravitate so other properties of the earthy material and the vaporous material um, so that, and you also get a sense with that so that the two are very closely related to one another, in the way that, in the um, in the poem and the emerald tablet, it says about that which is above corresponds to that which is below, and vice versa. So that kind of sense to it, um, and then going on to that, you're thinking you're in this sort of posture which is rather like the alchemical vessel, which is being perhaps heated and these materials inside undergoing transformations and changes. And that does bring to mind very much this sense for me of the, of, um, of the breath going into the body. And um, there is something I think uh, for me about the about the effect of the breath in the body, which I find very um, 
um, subtle and kind of difficult to to know, as it were. But nevertheless, there's, there's that sense of something, an effect of the breath, um, to do with a kind of dissolving process going on, um, which by which I mean a kind of um, a kind of letting go of something. You know, you can let go, and there's that sense in which something which had that form uh, is now losing its form and is changing into a kind of flowing uh, liquid. Um, and certainly that sense in which in the, the poem is described as a, a constant circulation of material, or a stage in which there's a constant circulation of material um, to do with the in-breath and the, the out-breath. Um, I wouldn't quite go so far as to say, well, you can identify the, um, the in-breath with a process of forming and the out-breath with a process of dissolving and exhalation. But there's certainly between them, the in-breath and the out-breath, uh, have something of that quality of this you know, releasing of a vapor, the condensation, the mixing with the earthy material that goes on that's described in the, uh, in the poem. And then coming to the last bit, um, where it goes, let's say, The colours rare that pierce the uh, every side of the, the toad. So, uh, if um, some meditators, um, fortunate meditators, I think their nimbitas are quite coloured. Um, uh, I'm one of the meditators who has to make do, as it were, with more subtle kinds of things. I don't see particular colours or anything, not often anyway. But um, so that definitely seems to have that sort of sense of um, nimbitas in the practice where you have these, uh, a wonder to the sight. So sometimes people describe the uh, nimbita as something um, wondrous in the sense of um, being amazed. Um, but the other sense of wonder in English as well about the sense of curiosity and sort of inquiry that uh, it may stimulate. Um, and then we have obviously white and ruddy as the completion of the process, which again, it's worth reflecting what kind of associations there are with white and with ruddiness. Um, so then of the venom handle, thus a medicine I did make. I couldn't help but think of um, what Nye Boomen has, uh, has taught uh, quite a few recent years about he not only teaches meditation but he teaches about medication, about a medicine um, and uh, the type of uh, medication that he refers to in that context uh, seemed very appropriate for alchemy <laughs> which has uh, the whole thing has this sort of sense of something uh, quite earthy and material and down to earth uh, which, as a, as a whole, I do find uh, quite appealing and resonant. So um, that's the uh, the process in the the poem, and uh, to complete this part of the meeting, do a bit more screen sharing and show some alchemical images. So besides um, with lots of writing of various kinds that alchemists did, uh, there are a whole treasure trove of uh, alchemical images as well. So I just want to show a few of those. See if I can do this. Okay. 
so. Um, the, this is not particularly linked to the poem that the other images I'll show are. This is just a kind of personal thing, that, uh, one of the images that I came across that seemed particularly, um, particularly beautiful, particular quality to it. So um, it's showing the, in the central part, an, an alchemist in Shasumi's uh, fairly traditional medieval costume, clothing, clothing. Um, on the right hand side, you see the uh, Athenor, which is the, um, well, the building as a whole, I suppose you'd say, with the alchemist laboratory. And here you have the Athenor, which is the, the furnace, which provides the, the heat for the alchemical process at various stages. And you have different vessels here um, being cooked in various ways to engender, to promote the alchemical process. Um, but one of the things that I liked about the, this picture was this sense of quite a, a personal meeting with somebody or something. And in this case, the alchemist is meeting uh, an angel, which is a symbol of nature. And the uh, a natural, naturally forming uh, alchemical process. So you have the, the three roots at the bottom, which uh, it explains somewhere, these are vegetable, mineral, um, animal roots, the, veg those, the kingdom of different sorts of things. And you have, I think, a little furnace inside there as well, like the alchemist has. And there you have this wonderful tree and uh, at the top you have um, a beautiful golden flower which is the alchemist's philosopher's the philosopher's stone or the elixir of life looks a bit like in my garden at the moment not due to any of my gardening skills i should add but there's uh, a very flourishing passion flower plant which uh, is somewhat similar to uh, this plant, this flower at the, uh, at the top. But um, what this, as part of the meaning of this, which is given, is the sense that um, it says in the explanation that's given in the blurb to this is that the alchemist is being um, told off in a way. He's spending too much time um, following recipes in his uh, laboratory and not enough time to to nature and he's forgotten he's made alchemy a mechanical process and forgotten that it's a natural process so uh, that rings a few bells you know you can very easily make meditation or i can make meditation a mechanical process where you follow instructions and forget it's a natural process so coming more images which are linked to the poem in some way or other in a general way. But here you have um, two miners, two, two people here, who are digging for the, uh, the ore from which to make their gold. So they're finding the prima materia. And we have the moon at the bottom and the sun at the top. So the moon here is uh, another symbol for the, the earthy, ashy, cindery material, which doesn't change with, when heated. And the sun is the vaporous material, which the two are separated in the process and then reunited. So um, there's kind of lots of images like this, which when I first saw them, they just seemed a little bit quaint. Um, uh, you know, kind of like kind of naive art, but um, the more I've looked at them, the more they've lost that quality and they have a much more magical kind of quality. So this is um, very characteristic of some of the images where this is an image for the separation process and it's so unexpected and so striking. 
It's quite amazing. So you have the, the green lion. So the green is the, the symbol for the prima material, the material that you start with. And like the, the toad whose bowels are full to brass, the, the lion vomits up the, the sun, the vaporous material. And here you have the blood which is doing the dissolving. So um, very earthy sorts of images. They don't pull their punches in alchemy. Um, but as I say, so striking. And so how on earth did they come up with that kind of image? The more, not quite so striking image, but still a very interesting one of the separation process. So you obviously <clears throat> got the, uh, the vessel, um, the body of the, um, the alchemist. And here you have the material, the bottom of the, uh, of the vessel. And it doesn't say, I haven't read an explanation of what this is, but it does look a bit toad-like. And the, the white dove, is uh, being is very often used as a symbol of the vaporous material, which is that part of that initial separation. He's flying upwards, but remember he has to come down as well. And you've got the four elements: earth, water, air, fire, of which there's quite a lot in the um, in alchemy, uh, not so much in the Ripley's vision. And this is again one of the very striking images which is given for what's going on in this process of separation and combining. So you have the image of two people making love, a man and a woman, and in this case the king and the queen. And here you have the, the moon and the sun again, and here you have the, um, the liquid which is dissolving the mercury, if you like, which is dissolving everything. So again, they don't sort of pull the punches, they come up with a very striking image. A more kind of discreet kind of image, if you like, is this one, the same thing, of the betrothal of the, the king and the queen. So it's that recombining of the those separated elements which is being uh, portrayed here. And you have the liquid parts because you have the Neptune creating the clouds, creating the rain, um, which again is the, the medium in which all this is happening. You have the moon, and the sun, and the furnace, and this is called the stage of conjunction, the coming together, the recombining. This is uh, quite an amazing one here of, um, again, the same union recombining of the elements. You have an, an hermaphrodite, a male and a female, and the eagles are the two components. So you have a, an eagle that's flying up, which is the vaporous material, and you have the earthy, cinder, ashy type of eagles at the bottom uh, of there. But I have no idea what the the rabbit or the hare and the bat is meant to signify. But um, again, it, it did bring to mind, again, uh, what Booman has uh, mentioned on many occasion about um, this question he puts about, well, if it's not man, if it's not woman, what is it? What's the word? What's the word? So here you have the hermaphrodite, the neither man nor woman. And the, uh, the black, or the darkness stage, so a simple, they have the vessel again, and the, uh, the decomposition, the completion of the decomposition and putrefaction um, process. And presumably, you, this is to indicate that it's there as a fertilizer. And the colors, the peacock's tail, So uh, denoting the, the colours after the, um, the stage of the, the blackness. So I don't see many peacocks around, but even in Manchester now, there are these uh, parakeets which have uh, established themselves in this country, which are quite colourful. 
um, to um, to finish. Um, we have the not quite sure how to say this. Aurora robus or something, something like that. Uh, I have the serpent eating its own tail, and um, the green meaning the beginning, and the red, the ruddy colour meaning the end, and it's uh, it's everything together. So although we may describe things in stages, ultimately they are just one thing. So with the serpent and eating its own tail, I'll come to an end. I'm going on a bit longer than I thought, um, but there is time for, before we conclude, with uh, any questions or comments that people have about this mysterious process of alchemy. Well, I want to thank you, Mark, very much. It's kind of, it was quite a wonderful journey, quite incredible. Um, because the whole area of alchemy is so mysterious and so uh, distant in a way that uh, by unfolding it through the poem and the images and the more that you spoke, it felt like we were going on an alchemical journey ourselves in a way. Um, and that, that in a sense has opened it more for me. I have been in one of Bernard's groups and, and other groups too. Um, and it was nice to open that whole area again. Um, I did wonder whether um, meditators or alchemists, you know, there are many, there were several kind of areas there where um, the processes seem to have more direct connection, particularly the idea of venom being transmuted into medicine and a you know, simple idea of the hindrances and the the difficulties and the, the kind of negativities can actually be what you work on and then it can change into a, a more open sort of enlightenment really. Um, and also that idea you have to kind of repeat and repeat with concentration and the whole process is a very complex one. So um, I got a lot from that. Um, I don't know whether I've got a question or not. <laughs> a, a, a question I started with, but might not be so central, but perhaps was that I wondered whether physicists like yourself and Bernard uh, were scientists. And, and I think Deb, there's probably other people out there who might have been scientists. And I've got a cousin who's a famous scientist, but she does have quite a deep spirituality as well. I just wondered, it doesn't have to be um, the central question, but there is there a connection somehow in knowing scientifically those uh, processes in physics and in the natural world, whether that makes you and others like you, Mark, kind of go deeply into these truths. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that anyway. Um, thank you again. Okay. Yes, I think... Um... I mean, having kind of come from something of a, of a science background, one of the appeals of alchemy was that it was to do with um, physical chemical processes. Mm -hmm. And the, the history of science is, is I find, very interesting. Um, and it's, it's quite, it, one thing that impresses me about alchemy is that um, it is rooted in people's first-hand experience of working with lots of materials in uh, in various kinds of processes um, so it does have that you know that sort of more um, material feeling to it if you like which is which I think is spiritual. appealing mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm. which brings the spiritual part a bit more down to earth in a way yeah yeah mm. Yes, it was. It was. Um, it was in fact quite interesting. I um, during the talk, I was sort of aware of, <coughs> of effects um, internally, um, and not quite sure what from from the kind of images or, or the descriptions, um, but almost and sometimes sort of feelings which were not necessarily quite quite sort of comfortable. Um, at, at moments, but I was much more aware than I'd been before how the 
how our kind of body becomes the kind of crucible. Um, and there's something about sitting there, particularly when <coughs> feelings come which are a bit uncomfortable or slightly difficult, and just allowing them to be there, um, uh, and allowing them to, to transform without kind of resisting too much. Um, sometimes they can go to kind of proliferative thoughts or we try to um, distract ourselves with other things, but sometimes actually just kind of sitting, sitting with them and just letting them be um, can have quite a useful effect. Um, but I, it was interesting, I was much more aware of that process. It, it's, it's, in, it's funny because the sort of process I kind of recognised from the past, but I, I had not thought of it in quite those terms, and that was very helpful in a sense, that um, it was just letting one's, one's, one's body at times be the crucible for that, for whatever needed to, to transform. Yes, it is very striking um, that you, on the one hand, you'd think that it's a very negative sort of process, all this description of the, the bursting of the, the toad and the venomous exhalations, which are described as really stinking. Um, but um, it's, it, it doesn't come across, in the end, it doesn't come across in that way. I think, as you say, it's perhaps to do with that sense of staying with those and not being repulsed by them. Um, yeah. When you first read the poem, did you say, then he himself burnt the body and then something else happened? Um, he burned the body of the frog. And then, and I wondered um, if that was the point at which the gold that was extracted change to elixir because he then did something with the, am I remembering it right the, ca the carcass of the frog mm. of the toad so. that's right yes they yeah. um, in the then he transmuted into something else didn't he mm. yeah in your poem so this is quite striking in the poem the first half of the poem is him watching something so mm. I saw this told and he saw it break up and he saw this. Yeah. And then um, the, the point in the poem where it says, um, for trial then his venom to expel I did desire. So he, it's the, the dreamer, the visionary, stepping in at that process, at that point. Yes, and doing something. And doing something with the carcass. And then the, as a result of that, he, uh, he takes the venom and makes it into the medicine. So it and does, at the end, at what the happened end, at the end? That's it. He makes the medicine and the, it's, uh, the medicine kills the venom and it uh, saves the life of anybody who by chance takes the venom, swallows the venom. And then the oh, final the part is the, mm. the glory be to him. Mm. Yes, so it's the transformation which then el the elixir can be taken by anybody. Yes. That yes. Mm. So it's not, to me, it seemed it's not entirely passive because then the magic has to come in and to do something as well <laughs> yes. in order to uh, allow it to transform uh, mm. something like that. I, I don't know if that's what you uh, implied. But. Mm. Hmm. But it seemed more than watching to me that at first magic is watching and experiencing and then stepping in to do something as well. Hmm. Uh, involve themselves with it. So. Yeah. So as, yes, there are those two very different hmm. halves, as it were, to the, to right. the point of watching and then doing something, stepping in, heating the carcass and uh, Handling, handling the the venom and making it into the medicine. Hi, Mark. Um, um, I just uh, couldn't resist letting you know that during the during the course of your talk, um, um, an email pinged into my box. So out of curiosity, I was just looking at it. it. Turned out to be a piece of junk mail, 
um, headed <laughs> investing in precious metals. <laughs> it's all about the virtue of investing in gold. So there you are. You're clearly in, in tune with the times. <laughs> so, um, I hope you haven't responded and clicked on the email there, Charles, and sort of clicked on a link in the email. So you might you might find false gold. You never know. It's something that the alchemists warn a great deal about. Indeed. <laughs> Good advice as ever. <laughs> we'll finish at that point then. And uh, could I ask you, Tracy, to chant a blessing to uh, complete the uh, the meeting? Bawati Sapa Mangalan Rakanti Sapa Devuta Sapa Buddha Nubawe Nasada Suti Bawantu Te Bawati Sapa Mangalan Rakanti Sapa Devuta Sapa Damha Nubawe Nasada Suti Bawantu Te Bawatu Sapa Mangalan Rakanti Sapa Devata Sapa Sanghanu Bawena Sada Suti Bawantu Te